Chris from Good Roads. It's been a minute. Good to see you again. We finally got access to the space that's going to be the semi-permanent home for all of our tools and set and shop work for the videos and the content that we put up here at Good Roads. But for now, uh, there's no tools in it. Which is actually perfect because starting today, I'm going to be putting out a series of videos on how you can make a skateboard with next to no tools and really inexpensive material costs. So to kick that off, today we're going to be building a set of molds for a board. They're a style of mold called a dim press. I didn't make this up. You can find them online. They've been used in the uh, kind of amateur mid-level board building community for a very long time. And they're made out of pine and insulation foam. Now, a dim press has some upsides and some downsides. But essentially what we have is a mold with a male and female half, and we are gonna be compressing them together with all of our sheets of wood in the middle. When the glue in between those sheets cures, we take it out of the mold and all the curves will be locked into place. So let me talk a little bit more about dim presses or dim molds and the advantages and some of the drawbacks. The drawbacks are that the foam is, first of all, a semi-flexible material, there's not a ton of flex to it, but it's got a little bit of give. So these molds aren't going to give you super precise shapes. You're not going to be able to get like the exact curves that you want, but you will be able to get a very, very close approximation. And the other drawback is that because of the tolerances in a mold like this, at least the way that we're going to be making it, there's very often a little bit of a gap between the male and female halves. And what that means is that we have to use a slightly stiffer material. So instead of using Canadian maple or rock maple plies, what we're going to be using is this. This is Baltic birch plywood. It also goes by Russian birch, or aircraft grade birch, marine birch. They're all different terms and names for uh, a high quality birch plywood. This is an eighth inch sheet. It's got three veneers in it. And what we're going to be doing is cutting this into thirds, we'll be doing three layers of plywood, which equates to nine plots. And we will actually, the way the math works out for that is that we will have six long grain and three cross grain. So it should be nice and strong. Um, I want to speak a little bit to the style of press or the style of mold. I love it. <laughs> the reason that I wanted to focus on this style of press for these videos is that they are so cheap. So even for someone like me who makes a lot of boards, they are just perfect for prototyping. If there's a quick idea you want to get out, if there's a shape that you want to experiment with and try something out, is this the one? This is kind of a standard skateboard mold. Um, I mean, we can take a minute to look at that, but you've got your kicktails and your concave. But say you wanted to try a board that had some rocker, in addition to the kicktails and concave. You don't really know how it's gonna ride, you don't know if you're gonna enjoy it. For something like that, that's just kind of an experiment, that if you don't know going into it whether or not you're even gonna like it, it doesn't make sense to build a really detailed, labor-intensive mold set. This you can do for cheap, and you can do it quick, and you can do it without any tools, or with next to no tools, and you can get right back into pressing boards and prototype. So, even for someone who's making a lot of boards who's done this before, I still think dim presses have a lot of value as a prototyping tool. But if you're just getting into it, almost certainly the cheapest way to get started. At least if you want to do complex geometry. So anything beyond like a long board that's just got some concave, maybe a little bit of a camera. If you want to get into kicktails, you want to get into wedges, you want to get into combinations of rocker and camber, you want to be able to experiment with different concave shapes cheaply and quickly, dim press is the way to go. So that's what we're going to do today. So we're going to show you how to be doing. It's the first step in making a skateboard for cheap with next to no tools. So let's get started. Let's take a quick look at materials and tools. The first thing you're going to need is some wood to back the molds on. The foam itself is not going to be rigid enough to take any kind of clamping force. So we've got to make sure that there's something rigid on the back in order to distribute that force and push our veneers into shape. I find the most cost effective way of doing that is just with some pine. You can get super cheap from any home goods store. You want to have a board for the male and female halves of the mold, so just make sure that you have enough lengthwise to do that. An 8 inch wide board 
will actually get you close to seven and three quarters and a 10 inch, you know, finger quotes, 10 inch wide board will be closer to nine and three quarters, nine and a half. I'm going with a 775 today because it's the board that I have. That'll get us uh, a pretty cool little street width. I'm going to be cutting it to about 30 inches because that's the size of my stock. Yeah, and then to make the actual interior of the mold, you need some rigid insulation foam. You want to look for foam that has an R value of 8 or 9 or higher. The R value is how insulating the foam is and a higher number indicates a denser foam. So there are foams out there that you can get at the store that are probably going to be too soft for what we need them to do. So make sure that's got a nice high R value. You only need a block of foam the size of the board that you're going to make and that is as thick as the tallest feature you want. So if you want a one inch high kicktail, the foam has to be at least one inch high. That's all I mean by that. The next and last thing you're going to need materials wise is just some glue. Now, literally any glue that will stick to foam and wood will work. Um, today, I'm going to be using a hot glue gun because it's fastest, but you can use standard PVA glue, you can use resin, you can use standard wood glue, or you can use some nicer wood glue. And for what it's worth, as we go through this project of making this board, if you are trying to save some money, use your type bond. Type bond 3 is the glue that we're going to use to bond the layers of the board together. So if you want to be really efficient with your money and you can only buy one glue, type on three. But you don't have to do it that way. And today I'm going to be using hot glue. Now let's talk tools. You need something to cut the foam with. And again, in the interest of saving money, the most efficient kind of tool you can get is, this is actually a used Sawzall blade, which will work great. Wow, that thing is beat up. Maybe it won't work so great. It'll work okay. <laughs> um, but if you're buying your tools new, you're going through Home Depot, there's a saw called a hole saw, which is meant for punching through drywall, cutting out spots for sockets and things like that. It's about this long, it's about this shape, and it costs about six bucks. That you can use to cut your foam, you can use it to cut down your backing boards for the molds, and you can use it to do the rough cutting when you get around to actually shaping your blank. So again, for cost efficiency, go for a hole saw. Now, that is not the most effective tool for any of those jobs. So, uh, if you have them, or if you have the money to get a couple more tools, a good hand saw, way easier to be cutting the backing boards and shaping your board with, and a utility knife that can have a long blade is gonna get you nicer cuts on shaping your foam. Making the actual curves and everything in the foam, this is actually a very good shape. The reason why, is unlike something like this, which is a pull saw, which is very flexible, a hole saw or a sawzall blade is actually pretty rigid. It doesn't have a whole lot of spring to it, and it's narrow, which means if you need to cut curves, you've got kind of the room with the how thin the saw blade is to navigate those curves. Whereas a broader saw like this, you would never be able to do like the transition from the edge of some concave back down into the kicktail. So a blade like this for agility, a blade like this for cutting wood, and a blade like this for clean lines on your phone is the most that you would need as far as cutting tools go. But you can get away with just this. Next, and I suppose last, we need uh, a straight edge of some kind and something to mark our lines with. And again, if you're trying to save money, you can eyeball it, but it's way better to use a straight edge. I grabbed some tape too. I'm not gonna need this today for my build because the hot glue sets very quickly, but if you're using one of these other glues, especially one of the PVA-based glues, the foam kind of doesn't let any air through because it's an insulator, and it takes a long time for the glue to dry. So it can be very helpful to use some tape to just tack your parts in place as the glue dries if you're waiting. Something to keep in mind if you're using one of these longer setting glues. Okay, so, that is our tool set and our materials, so let's get started. First thing we're going to do is cut our backing boards. So I'll talk more about Baltic Birch when we get into the video about actually pressing the board, and I'll talk about some other material options you have and ways to source it, because it can sometimes be a little bit hard to get a hold of. But for the boards I'm going to be making today, this is the sheet that I have, and I 
don't need the mold to be any longer than the stock. So I'm just gonna use my sheet of wood to mark out my lengths for my backing boards. Use a tape measure and a square too, but this just saves you a little bit of work. Cool. First we're just gonna take our saw and cut our boards. Little tip, just a little Sawyer's tip. If you grab your saw like a pistol grip and put your finger along the edge of the blade, it'll help you keep that cut nice and straight. Great, so we have our backing boards for our male and female sides of the mold. The next thing that we need to do is cut a block of foam to shape. So, again, instead of using a ruler, just because it's one extra tool to have to deal with, we can do it just using the, the backing board as our measuring tool here. And I think, looking at this particular chunk of foam, that I'm actually going to cut all four sides because the ones that came off of the machine are really not flat. There's dips and curves and everything else in it. You can use that, it's not gonna hurt your mold too much, but it makes layout of all of your board shapes easier if you have nice straight sides. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be using this here utility blade, uh, but for both cutting out the backing boards and the foam, if all you wanna do is spring for that $6 hole saw, it'll do the job. It's gonna be a little bit more rough and it's gonna require a little bit more elbow grease, but it will work. They all help that Cool. There we go. Now I've got a nice smooth edge to work with when I go to mark my lines for cutting my board geometry later. I'm just going to do that on all four of the other sides. got a piece of foam that will live between our two backing boards that we will cut our board geometry out of and using that we'll be able to make both the male and female sides of the mold. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to take the shape that we planned for our board and all the geometry and we're going to lay it out on the block of foam so that we know where to cut. I'm thinking because of the size of this board and kind of for my favored wheelbase range that I'm going to actually make a single kicktail mini cruiser type board. I like to have a slightly wider wheelbase. You could probably make a on the small side street deck using the dimensions that we have here, but I want that wheelbase. So what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a nice mellow kick in the back. I'm gonna have probably a kind of shallow concave and just a little tick, not even really kicktail, but just a little hook on the front so that you have something to lock your front foot against. So, let me take the backing boards out of the way and then we can start laying out our deck. Something that I like to do, that I find super useful whenever I'm making any deck, is to start with the center line. And then, in general, you wanna maintain the idea of where that center line is as you go all the way through making your deck. And the idea there is a center line is the line that you want your bolt holes aligned with. So you want to establish your center line in the mold so that you know that you've got the same amount of concave on one side of the board as the other. You want to transfer that center line to the blank when you make it so that you know where the center of the blank is. And eventually you use that center line to make sure that your bolt holes are aligned. So first things first, let's get ourselves a center line. To mark my lines, I'm using a Sharpie. This is big, shows up on screen pretty well, it's easy to see, but you can use anything. You can use a pencil or a pen or a nail and just scratch the lines into the foam. This isn't super precise work, so I find the big fat dark line of a Sharpie to be helpful so that you can see your lines later when you're cutting. Like I said, I wanna have a kicktail, figure out kind of a rough idea of where I want my wheelbase to be. If we're doing a mini cruiser, what do we think of like a five inch kicktail? That's kind of short. Six inch? Yeah, let's do a six inch kicktail. Or 
have six inches here, and six inches here. You could do this with a square if you have one, and I do, but I do want to show you guys that you can do this with like a pretty minimal set of tools. So this line here is going to be where our kicktail starts. We're going to cut our kicktail out of this side of the board. I want to have a little tiny nose scoop thing. We'll do two inches for that. It's going to be so subtle in the final product, but with a little luck, you'll be able to feel it and it will make for a better board. So let's mark that off. Looks good. And I like a pretty U-shaped concave as opposed to a tub one where you've got a bit of a flat bottom or a W concave. You can do all of those things in foam, but I am basically just gonna kind of eyeball doing this in thirds, which should give me a nice U concave. Now, you know what, we'll do quarters. We'll go about there, we'll measure that, and we'll make sure that we have the same measurement out from the center. And by measuring it out from the center, you know that it's symmetrical. Even if you have a little bit of extra material on your foam on either side, you really want to be relying on that center line because you can always cut material off the sides of the boards, but you can't cut it out of the middle. All right, I'm going to draw the lines now for our concave. And the next thing that we need to allow for is wood can really only bend in one direction at a time. So we need to make space for a transition from the concave, which is going to be here, to the kicktail, which is going to be here. So this needs to go flat. The easiest way that I've found to do that is to kind of just make a little chamfer. You might want to give yourself a little bit of room and tuck this out a little bit so that there actually is a little bit of flat before the kicktails. But in this case, I'm going to rely on the slight flexibility of the foam to kind of just make up for any imperfections. And that's one of the nice things about doing these dim presses is, is as long as you have a rigid enough material, it'll get close enough. So let's just draw our connecting lines back here. And to kind of just illustrate, this is gonna be our kick and this shape is gonna all turn into kicktail. These are going to be our concave on this side and this side. And this is going to be our nose up here. And no, I did not want to write concave upside down. So the next thing that we have to do is lay out what the side profile of these shapes are going to be so that we know where to cut on the sides. Something to keep in mind as you're doing this is that your kicktail can only be as long on the diagonal as your saw blade, because you have to cut all the way through the foam at once. But we'll get to that in a little bit. So just as a quick check as you're laying it out, take your saw blade and make sure that it is longer than the longest cut you have to make on your kicktail. So what we're gonna do now is take this two-dimensional shape that we laid out on the top of our mold blank and transfer it to the sides so that we can have those shapes in three dimensions. The kicktail, I'm gonna make the full height of my block of foam. So I'm gonna find the edge of my kicktail as I marked it out on the top and I am just going to draw a line from that to the corner of the block. Do the same thing for the nose, but the nose I am not going to make as high as the kicktail. So let's mark out, you know, let's do a half inch. And mark our triangle there. I want to make a correction real quick. This diagonal line that I drew here for the concave is going the wrong way. It needs to go like this. This edge is going to be thin and it's going to flare up and draw the side of our concave, which means it needs to be doing the opposite going this way. So I'm going to correct this really quick. So let's take a look here. We've got our line coming in from the kicktail here, which ends here. And we've got a line that's going to start our concave here. But we want this curve or this shape be a gradual transition. So what we're going to do is establish the basic height of our concave as it goes along the edge of the board. We'll do a half inch again. I'm just going to mark a couple lines from the bottom of our mold along the edge and then connect them.
And then we're gonna draw this transition here from the bottom of the kicktail to the beginning of the concave. And it doesn't need to be perfect. The foam itself will kind of make up for any mistakes, but it's nice to have that be a good gradual curve. That way the wood has room to bend. So now you can start to see some of the three dimensional shapes we're gonna be making. Our concave is gonna go from here to here, and then down along this edge, and down along this line here. Our kicktail is gonna go down through this line here, and then across our mold here, so it's got a nice square transition. I'm gonna go through and just mark the side components of the nose, and then flip it over and do the other side. So again, we've got our little nose, it's gonna go like that, and we've got our concave, which we're gonna cut out, and the shape's gonna go like that. The last piece of marking that we need to do is to just mark the last line to outline the nose and tail on the front and back of the mold. I'm just gonna take the marks that we made initially from the side, extend them onto the front and back of the mold, like that, and connect them with a line. Great. I guess we don't need to do that for the tail because the line for the tail is just the edge of the mold. So that's perfect. Up next, we're gonna start cutting our foam. So grab your saw, and again, it's gonna be advantageous to have a long, stiff, narrow saw. And I recommend starting with a kicktail instead of the concave, because the concave has got a slightly more complex cut to it. You wanna get a feel for how the saw cuts through the foam. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna start on the line that we drew on the side, cut down through the block while trying to keep the back side of the blade in line with the line on the front of the mold, and the front side of the blade in line with the line that we drew here. That will cut a nice wedge out of our foam, which we'll be able to use both sides of. So let me get through the cut, and then I'll describe a little bit how this is gonna work. But again, just keep a firm grip. If you're worried about the saw wandering, just go slow. You can always tilt and twist your hands. That's one of the advantages of having a narrow saw is that you can steer a little better. And then just take your time and be careful, and you should have no problems. So as I'm cutting, I'm watching where the saw blade cuts along this line, and I'm watching where it cuts along this line, kind of moving my eye back and forth to make sure that it stays in line. If it wanders out of the way a little bit, I can either twist this way or twist this way to get the saw back in line. If you go slow, you should be able to keep it in control and make sure those lines are straight. If there's little variations, it's not gonna matter because the foam that sticks up or that is pressed down a little bit will just get compressed when we actually press the bore in it. So there's a little room to make mistakes here. You don't have to be perfect. Cool. So, this block that we cut the piece away from, this is gonna be our male side of the mold, and you wanna hang on to the pieces that you're gonna cut off, because we're gonna piece those together, and those are gonna be the negative, the female side of the mold, that we're gonna use to push the layers between. So, as best as possible, try to make sure that the pieces that you cut off come off in a single piece, because we're gonna be using them. Next, let's do the kicktail. It's the same cut, it's just a little bit bigger, so it helps to be a little bit more patient, and just take your time. Since this is a long, flat cut, I'm gonna switch over to using this wood saw. And I'm hoping that I'll still be able to keep it in line. Even though it's a broad blade, I won't have to steer it too much. And it should make faster work of this cut because this was slow going on this. You can only really move the blade back and forth about an inch. So you get there eventually, but I'm thinking this might be faster, so I'm gonna give this a try. Here we go. I'm glad I made that choice. It did make faster work of it. You'll see that my kicktail line got a little bit twisted there, but all I'm gonna do to help with that is I'm just gonna shave some off up on this end to even it out a little bit. I'll probably do the same here. Grab my knife real quick and just even out that line. And I'll do the same. 
it waits long enough. It is. Just smooth out that transition a little bit. And there we go. We've got the male half of our kicktail and the female half. And they'll go together like that. The last set of cuts that we have to make are the ones for the concave, and they're the most complicated ones. And what we're gonna have to do is start on this corner here, keep the edges of our blade along this line, and then steer it so that it intersects these two lines. And then this is just a long cut, similar to the way our kicktails went. But this, this curve up front here, that's the reason why there's an advantage to having a narrow blade because it makes it much easier to steer through that cut. But just like everything else, if you go slow and take your time, watch your edges, watch your cut, you should be able to steer your blade through that. If you make any mistakes, the foam can kind of account for it. You can always add, you can glue more foam in place if something goes wrong, but you can do it in one shot and that's the best way to do it. So that's what I'm gonna try to do now. We're gonna start at this corner, cut in, and then turn and go down the line. So we made it to our transition, now we're gonna turn, which I'm doing by just twisting my hand and forcing the blade to cut a curve. Great, we made it through the transition, now I'm just gonna cut along these two lines the same way we did for the kicktails, all the way down to the other end, where I'm gonna transition back out, and then we'll do the other side. There we go. Now the other side. Something that's good to do, just a quick note, is mark your cutoffs from the sides with the side that they correspond with. So we're gonna call this one A, and we're gonna call it A, and this is the nose. And that'll just make sure that the parts that you cut out are still matched up with the places that you cut them from. There we go. Cool. And let me do that thing where I mark, just to be clear. This is my B side, and this is the nose. Cool. So what's left are five pieces of foam. This block is gonna be the male side of our mold, and you can see the skateboard would kind of be oriented that way. We've got a kicktail, we've got a little hook for the nose, and we've got our concave. And then the female side is just going to be the parts that we cut off opposite of that. And we're gonna glue those in place, and when you put material between the two and clamp them together, it'll press all of the plywood into the shape of the board that we're looking to have. So the next step is to take our pieces of styrofoam that we just cut and attach them to our backing boards. Just as a quick note, you can go in at this point and clean up your mold pieces if you want, sand them out, smooth them out so that they're not so rough, but you don't have to. Because we're using a stiffer material, we're using that Baltic birch, and because the foam has a little bit of give to it, even though the surface is rough, there'll be enough surface area in the right places so that when we squeeze it down, the pressure will get applied where it needs to go. So you can go in and clean it up. It'll make it look nice. It's always good to kind of practice your fit and finish, but you don't have to. This is gonna be good enough. So I'm just gonna go with this for now. Just waiting for that glue gun to heat up. And then we're gonna do the male side first, because it's easier. It's just a single block, and all we have to do is make sure it's lined up with the edges. And then we'll do the female side. All I'm gonna do, is spread a bunch of glue on the wood, and then put the foam on top of it. Now this is a high temperature glue gun, so if I put it directly on the foam, then it's gonna melt it, which is why I prefer to do it on the wood first. Uh, a lower temperature glue gun isn't so bad about that, but you have a little bit less time to work. If you're using a high temperature glue gun, especially when you get to the thinner areas, just be careful because it might melt through the foam and get on your hands and it's very hot. And that does not feel very good, I can tell you from experience. Here we go. Like I said, for the male side, this is much easier because all you have to do is tack it down. We don't need a ton of surface area with the glue. All we're doing is making sure it stays attached to 
to our backing board. Made a little mistake glue in there, pulled it up, broke my piece of foam. This is one of the reasons I love the presses so much because they are so forgiving. All I gotta do is put a little bit more glue down, put the piece that broke off back in place, and it will still work. <laughs> These things, on top of being cheap and easy to make, there is a ton of room for error. It's really, they're just really, really easy. All right, so we got our mail half, and I like to use the male half as a reference for the female half, just to make sure everything's lined up. I marked the sides of my concave, A and B, when we cut them earlier, and I marked which end was the nose. So when I grab my concave pieces, this one says B, this is the B side, and I've got my mark for the nose, so I can just line those up. I can do the same thing for the A side. My A, and there's my mark for the nose. Kicktail. And the nose. Now, there's a couple ways you could do this. One that I think works pretty well is you put the backing board down, you put your glue down, you flip your pieces over, and this is especially important for the concave because they have to go to the opposite side because it has to get flipped back over for the molds to work together. You tack them down that way. You can also put glue on this and put the board on top of it. It helps if you're going to do it that way to have something between the two layers, like a terrain wrap or something. That helps you get your parts aligned a little bit better. The concave, for example, hasn't like shifted side to side. But for today, for demonstration purposes, I am going to uh, do it the first way that I described by flipping the pieces over. I can see, just because these two parts are next to each other, about the size of where the block of foam for the kicktail needs to go. So I'm gonna draw slightly within that shape with my glue. Block over. Lining up the edges. Tacking it down. That worked great. Do the same thing really quickly for the nose. Ooh, just barely. Alright, that should be plenty. Beautiful, beautiful. And again, just like with the cutting, the concave is the hard part. Because we do want to make sure this is good and lined up here. Because we have that little bit of gap on both sides. And we want to make sure that when we put the molds together, they fit. So I am going to draw a bead down the edge and try as best as possible using the male side as a visual reference to get the female side lined up. this over and you'll see I'm gonna move it a little bit this way that looks pretty close make sure the edge is lined up watch my fingers because that glue is hot and this is a thin piece of foam it'll come straight through it and then we're just gonna flip the B side and do the same thing edges are correct. Push it down a little bit. This would be the part if you're using like a white glue or a wood glue. You can take a roll of tape and use the tape to tap down your parts. And all that does is hold it in place so they don't shift around while the glue is drying. Now the hot glue gun it's already good to go. So you don't have to do that, but it does make it a little bit easier if you go with a slower setting glue. And that's it. That's our mold done. We've got the male side and the female side. We do a quick check, flip the halves over, make sure they fit together. Make sure that there's not too much of a gap anywhere. Let's take a look here. Yeah, that gap looks okay. That's actually, I think that's one of the better ones I've done. That's cool. So our two mold halves fit together well. We've got one last thing that can be helpful to do, which is to grab our Sharpie again. And we mark that center line at the beginning of the process. We want to make sure that we can see it from the outside of the mold. So just continue that on 
across and down your sides. Do the same thing on the tail. You could also do it, you know, on the foam pieces before you incorporate them into the mold. That works just fine. The reason I'm doing this now is because it's much easier to transfer the center line from the mold to the blank when it's still in the mold instead of sitting there and having to try to ca calculate the center line on top of the blank. So we're going to have our pieces of wood in here. They might overlap, they might shift around a little bit while we're pressing. But if we have our center line on the mold, when it's done curing, all we have to do is mark it there, mark it there, and we can draw our center line right down on the board. Excellent! So that is how you make a really cheap, easy set of skateboard molds. So this is probably the most important part of making a skateboard. The next most important thing is we need something to squeeze them together. And there's a lot of ways of doing that inexpensively too. And in the next video, I'm going to be showing you two of them. The absolute cheapest way to do it is just to pile heavy stuff up on top. So we're going to be pressing the board that way. And we're also going to make some clamps that are really easy to turn into a kind of static manual skateboard press. So that's going to be the next video coming out shortly. I hope you liked it. I hope you find this useful. I hope that when this series is out that you will go make skateboards because I think it's so much fun. It's so much fun to ride the gear that you have made yourself. It's so enjoyable and being able to do it this quickly and cheaply, you can try out a bunch of different shapes. You can ride kinds of boards that you wouldn't otherwise be able to because the cost is so low. I love it. I want to share it with you guys. I hope this inspires you. Stick around for the next set of videos. I'll show you the rest of the process and until then, I'll see you soon. to the table.